Hi everyone, this is Dr. Young. Uh, the title of this course is Topics in Ancient World History. Um, the first couple of uh, videos here will just address um, what we call prehistory, that is the period before writing, um, and then uh, some of the earliest civilizations. And we'll talk about what a civilization is, kind of what the definition there is. Um, before moving on to these periods in the ancient world that we call the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Um, I'm going to try to keep these fairly brief. There's a lot of information in the textbook that um, you'll be able to, to get to kind of supplement what we, we talk about here, or rather these videos will supplement what's in the textbook. Um, I think it's necessary to talk about prehistory because one of the questions that we want to raise in this course is, you know, why is writing so important? Historians tend to study written material. Um, and... Uh, that, of course, is maybe the best medium for uh, preserving information. Um, and writing starts in world history around 4,000 BCE or so. Um, and so it's been around for about 6,000 years. Um, and I, I think that uh, it's important to acknowledge that moment, right? Because this, this also corresponds with the rise of the earliest civilizations. But of course, human beings lived for uh, tens of thousands of years as a species before that, uh, during which time we developed um, vital uh, components of the life of our species, especially um, spoken language, a very complex language uh, system that allowed us to communicate in ways that are subtle um, and uh, really set us apart from, from other animals. Um, there's a really interesting book called Sapiens, by Noah Yuval Hari. It's a book that I would recommend reading at some point in your life, but um, one of the things that Hari brings up in there is the differences uh, in communication between human beings and other animals. Um, and uh, he says, for instance, you know, uh, apes, monkeys, others uh, can can communicate with each other, right? They can say, and even, I mean, birds can do this, right? I think other animals have the ability to communicate um, within the species. But they can only say uh, very general things. Like a monkey can, you know, communicate with other monkeys and say danger, right? Uh, even perhaps danger on the ground, right? Danger, there's a lion lurking nearby or something like that. Or danger from the air. Uh, there's an eagle, um, you know, uh, swooping around that could uh, grab us from the trees or whatever. Um, but human beings are the only ones who can, uh, who developed a, a really complex way of talking with one another. Um, where we could say, uh, there's a lion, you know, five paces to your left, please be careful, it might be good to throw a rock uh, to distract it, it hasn't noticed you yet, and I mean, we can go on and on with the nuances we can add to language, right? Um, uh, and so this, this is one of the ways that human beings, which actually started out fairly low on the food chain, were able to differentiate themselves from other animals. Um, now, uh, one of the things to note about the period before writing, which is really kind of the second major revolution in human history after the development of the spoken language, is that, that humans did record things, right? There is a record of this period. Um, and we can find this uh, record documented in things like art, right? This is a good example of art from what we call the Paleolithic age. Um, this is the period before agriculture, and so agriculture is the third major um, uh, revolution in human history, right? Um, uh, or rather, agriculture and writing tend to kind of correspond with each other, so I guess we could say that's all part of a second revolution. Um, but uh, the Paleolithic, or the Old Stone Age, which, you know, goes back like 50,000 years, right, from the time that human beings start to uh, have this ability to speak with one another in nuanced ways. We, we, we were making a record um, that's mostly preserved in art um, and also in tools. This statue uh, comes from around 20, 20 to 25,000 years ago, right? This is uh, one of a number of statues that have been unearthed in different parts of the world. These are called Venus statues, um, uh, simply because it, it portrays a woman. This possibly is a deity figure, maybe a fertility goddess or something like that. Um, though its exact nature is uncertain. And one of the questions that I would just ask you to, to ponder is, what does this mean, right? Um, uh, one question I like to ask students when I, I bring this image up is, does this represent an ideal or a reality? Did women really look like this in the Paleolithic age? Um, when they were living as hunter-gatherers? And the answer is almost certainly not, right? Um, 
even though hunter-gatherers actually lived um, much more comfortable lives, it seems, than we might assume. Um, food wasn't necessarily scarce, but but it's pro they probably did not have an abundance such that one could become obese like this, right? Rather, um, this seems to represent an ideal. If a woman actually looked like that, it would mean that there was an abundance of food, that they wouldn't have to sort of pursue the life that... Um, that they pursued where they were constantly searching for food. Uh, one of the, the most important um, social needs of the Paleolithic age, the hunter-gatherer period, was of course reproduction. This woman um, with the enlarged breasts is obviously capable of providing nourishment for a, a, a child, right? Um, the sexual organs are uh, also displayed here, um, indicating that this woman is, is capable of reproducing, of having children, right? And so this this is a social ideal. Uh, the face, by contrast, is not shown in any detail, possibly because faces are tricky to depict in art, but um, probably because the face really isn't that important, right? The other parts of the female anatomy um, were more vital for the survival of the society, right? So we have these evocative things that help us get some glimpse of what life was like uh, in the Paleolithic age. Um, cave paintings are another one, right? Lots of cave paintings in different parts of the world. Um, in fact, all over the world, we find art like this, which shows the life that these people lived. And, you know, what we find is that people were hunting and gathering. Um, they were pursuing food, um, and they were successful at this. The fact that human beings survived uh, as hunter-gatherers for, you know, upwards of a quarter million years shows that we got really good at this as a species. Um, that human beings were really incredibly successful. We, during that period, we, you know, made it to the top of the food chain. We were the, the alpha predators, so to speak, bringing down even large game um, that perhaps had greater physical capabilities than we did, right? Um, we did that through largely the use of tools. Um, initially, the, the earliest tool record we have uh, display things like the one you see on the left here, right? These simply simple chipped pieces of stone that could function in a number of ways. This, this, um, the technical term for this is a hand axe. Okay, so this could be a chopping device, a cutting device, um, a blunt instrument of some kind. You know, to uh, probably mash things in. Like if you found a, you know, a melon or something like that, right? This would uh, access that or a nut or, or whatever. Um, but it could also be used to cut or to uh, to bludgeon something. Um, Right? It's, it's a multi-purpose tool. It's not very subtle. It fits in the palm of the hand. Right, it's, These are all roughly of the same size. Um, it's a, it's a multi-purpose kind of thing. Right, If you're familiar with the multi-tool today, like the Leatherman or something like that, this is the ancient version of the Leatherman. Right, It's a, it's a knife, it's an axe, it's a, it's a cutting uh, instrument of various kinds, it's a hammer, it's you know, a lot of different things. Right, Over time, um, and getting on toward what we call the Neolithic age, the tools become smaller and more specialized, right? Uh, the middle image here shows uh, spear points that are smaller, more subtle, probably specialized for bringing down certain kinds of game. Uh, and then we even have things like the one on the right here, also made of bone, um, which has barbs in it. This is, this is probably a fish hook of some kind, right? Something for spearing fish. So the tools become more specialized, they get smaller. Uh, these are called microliths, meaning small stone tools, right? And so we can trace in the, in the tool record the development of the human society. Now, as I said, the second great revolution after the development of language happened probably around, uh, starting around 10,000 BCE. This is something that took many centuries and even millennia to run its course. Um, parts of the world did not really move into the what we call the agricultural revolution um, until much, much later than earlier parts did, right? So starting around 10,000 BCE and maybe taking about 10,000 years to make it to all parts of the world, we have something called the Neolithic or the agricultural revolution. And we can notice the difference in the, in the kinds of tools that survive from this period. Um, you can see that instead of these general things for hunting or for digging, right, there are m much more specialized tools, uh, things for cutting different kinds of crops. Of course, we have here um, grinding instruments because 
any kind of grain crop, which are you know just domesticated grasses. Um, these must be ground in order to be assimilated into the human body, right? We have different kinds of uh, chopping devices and other things. Um, and uh, the agricultural revolution changed the way that people live fundamentally, probably greater than any revolution in human history, any, any kind of uh, sequence of events in human history, except maybe the technological revolution, which is ongoing today, right? We are really becoming uh, different as a species than we were. Um, but the, the um, agricultural revolution led to uh, human beings, um, instead of existing in hunter-gatherer bands of maybe 20 to at most 100 people, uh, forming settlements that may have reached, well, certainly by about 3000 BCE, reach upwards of 100,000 people. So vastly larger than had existed before, right? And it's at that point we can begin to talk about civilization, okay? Uh, what, what happens as a result of agriculture? Well, people can settle in much larger areas, um, and we get differentiation in the tasks that people did. Somebody who's really good at making tools, for instance, would not have to farm. They could spend all of their time making these sickles or these grinding stones or these axes or whatever, um, and they could, uh, you know, make a living that way, whereas the farmers would, would then pay them, either in kind or actually money is not developed until the Iron Age, so really money is not around at this point, but perhaps some medium of exchange. We're probably bartering, you know, they would pay food for these tools, um, and so people can specialize. Uh, this does lead to stratification of society, of course, because land is not equal everywhere. Those who own the best land uh, and can farm more, most effectively would produce more food and thus become more wealthy than others. Um, also, those who had certain kinds of capabilities like tool making or especially fighting. It's um, because land is scarce and thus fought over thus, you know, the source of conflict, um, those who can fight the best tend to be the most prized in society. Now, this leads to uh, a number of um, consequences, for instance, the denigration of women, right? Men have an advantage when it comes, just generally speaking, when it comes to physical strength and fighting. One of the disadvantages that women have is that in the absence of birth control, they you know, produce children uh, periodically, um, which makes it so they have to carry a large load around uh, in their own body. This compromises their ability to... Uh, 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 to fight and things like that, right? So for, for these reasons, men tend to take a prime position, particularly warriors, right, in these uh, emerging agricultural societies. Um, there's a lot of other consequences to this. The development of um, trade, the development of uh, things like law and government, right? All of this is the result, really, of the agricultural revolution. And we'll see those things play out as we discuss uh, these early civilizations. Um, so I think I'm going to stop it there. There's a lot more to say about this, but we'll move on in the next lecture um, and talk about uh, the development of civilization, what civilization means, kind of the scale of the whole thing, right? Um, so I'll see you next time. Thanks.